trumpets will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says that when the dead in Christ is raised out of the graves, then we will go up alongside with them. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 4 says that the Lord will descend with a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and then those who are alive and remain, so that's you and me, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then the Bible says we will be with the Lord forever. So wherever He goes, we will go alongside of Him. Hallelujah. So if He's in heaven, we'll be with Him in heaven. And when He comes down back to earth, we'll be alongside with Him. Hallelujah. So, as you guys know, I think I'll just quickly explain. There's four Gospels, if you don't know. Okay, there's the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay, so you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're known as the, go the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Luke, and John. So, each one of those Gospels shows a different side and a different perspective of Jesus. So Matthew is written more to the Jewish people. okay, And Matthew focuses more on the kingship of Jesus. So if, you, if the Bible, if you read Matthew and you start off, it says the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And why is that important? Because the son of David means Jesus is the son of the king. Because David was the king of the Jews. He was the king chosen by God to be the king of the Jewish people. So that means Jesus has, is an heir to the king of, throne of David. And interestingly, all the genealogies of the Jewish people have been destroyed. When, uh, when Alexandria was destroyed and all their books and stuff were destroyed. The only genealogy the Jewish people have is the one found in the Bible. So the only genealogy that proves who is the next king is the one in Matthew and Luke. It shows that Jesus is the king of the Jews. So no one else can claim, I think I'm from the line of David, so I must be a, a king or whatever. No, Jesus is the only one that has that title. Jesus is the son of David, the king of the Jews. And every book of the Gospels has been a face to it okay and the face of the book of Matthew is the lion because the lion represents Judah so Judah is uh, Judah is where David comes from okay so th therefore the book of Matthew represents the face of Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah the king of the Jews hallelujah so today we'll start off the Christmas Chronicles by looking at the lion of the king of Judah. Hallelujah. Jesus, the king of Judah, the king of the Jews, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we'll start off by reading Matthew chapter 1. So I didn't put it on there. So you can turn to Matthew 1, verse 18. So maybe next week or the week after that, we'll read 1 to 18. Okay, but today we're going to read 18. To the end of chapter 1. See, the Holy Spirit was like throwing me, like, no, you must do this one first. Okay. So verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit." Verse 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Wow. Then it says, So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, 
Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Wow, that's amazing. So, so firstly, we're going to focus on Matthew 1 verse 21. And it says, They call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So what can you take out of this already? What must they call the child or the son? Jesus. And Jesus means salvation. Okay? It's a direct like a direct translation from the Greek, from the Hebrew, Yeshua. And Yeshua means Yah saves. Yah is salvation. Okay? And Yeshua doesn't just mean to save, it means health. It means deliverance. It means protection. It means safety. So it's a complete word to say that if you need, whatever you need to be saved, Jesus does that for you. If you need health, Jesus gives you health. If you need deliverance, Jesus gives you deliverance. So, and then the Greek word for Yeshua is soteria. So actually, which is then sozo. Sozo is the verb and soteria is the noun. So if you had to translate Jesus' name into Greek, his name should have been soteria. But it's a direct translation from the, from the Hebrew. That's why it's Jesus, Yeshua. So actually it should have said, call his name Yeshua, for he will Yeshua his people from their sins. Amazing. So we're going to be focusing on this today. Because why is this so important? Why is the gospel so important? Why is knowing that Jesus saves you from your sins so important? Okay. So are you determined to behold Jesus Christ? And have fresh revelation of Jesus Christ every day. Because every day you need to have fresh revelation of Jesus. And behold Jesus. Because when you behold Jesus, that is faith. Okay, because what is the law? The law is about doing. While faith is about beholding. So in our life, it's important to behold Jesus. And what does the Lord want us to behold of Him? What is the principal thing what is the first thing we must behold of Jesus every day like my dad said this morning you need to preach the gospel to yourself every day hallelujah so what is the gospel okay we're going to take a look at Romans 1 verse 16 but before that are you ashamed of the gospel or are you tempted to be ashamed of the gospel So let's take a look at Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. So gospel means good news. So I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So of Hamashiach, the Messiah. Okay. For it is the power of God to salvation. Soteria, there's the noun. So we saw the verb just now, sozo. Now it's the noun, soteria. To, over, uh, to everyone who is believing, both to Jew first and to Greek. So like we saw in Matthew, Jesus is the king of the Jews. So Jesus came first for the Jewish people. That's why when that woman was shouting out to Jesus, the Syrophoenician woman, son of David, help me. Jesus ignored her because he's not son of David to her. He's only Lord to her. That's why when she said, Lord, help me, he turned around and helped her. Because his son of David is for the Jewish people. He's the king of the Jewish people. Hallelujah. So, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So that's why I asked you, are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Are you tempted to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ? If you're not tempted to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, maybe God is not your source. Because, why did Paul say, I am not ashamed? Because he was tempted to be ashamed. That's how awesome the good news is. Because when you say, all your sins are forgiven, past, present and future, 
you're tempted to be ashamed of that. Because you're saying it to people that said, no, you have to live right and do good. Then God will accept you. But when you tell them, no, God accepts you because of what Jesus did. And through His blood, He's forgiven you of all your sins. You could be tempted to be ashamed. The same way, if God is not blessing you to an amount where you can bless others, and you're not so blessed that you feel almost a bit ashamed to have all these blessings, then maybe God is not your source. You need to be so blessed that you can bless other people that you are tempted to feel ashamed of how good God is to you. If you're walking around in a COVID and virus world and you don't get sick, you don't get the sniffles, nothing bad happens to your body and everyone else gets sick, you could be tempted to feel ashamed. Like, why am I not getting sick? Because the gospel says that my God shall supply all your needs. The gospel says that a thousand can fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So if you're not tempted to feel ashamed, then maybe God is not your source. So that's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. So that is encouraging. It means you, can, you need to know that God wants to supply above and beyond. So you expect God to do this, God is going to go above it. Hallelujah. If you expect God to do nothing, then you're not giving God much to work with because God always needs to oversupply what you give Him. So that's why when you give Jesus five loaves, what is it, five loaves and two fish, then He gives you 5,000 loaves and more than left over. But if you're not giving, expecting God to do anything, then He can't do anything for you. Hallelujah. So it's an encouragement to know that you need to live your life in such a way that you could be tempted to feel ashamed of the gospel. That's why Paul, that's why every time when Paul preached the gospel, they told him, shall we sin more so that grace may abound? Then Paul's like, your condemnation is just because you're not understanding. But they were, the way Paul preached that all your sins are forgiven, past, present and future, they said, so we can just go live in sin. Because he preached so strongly on all your sins are forgiven, past, present and future. Hallelujah. So, what does it say? For it is the power of God to salvation. And who is the power of God? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 24 says that Christ is the power of God. So when you read this, what are you reading? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is Jesus to everyone who believes. Because Jesus is the power of God. And Jesus is salvation. So you say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is Jesus to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. That's powerful. Then it says, verse 17, For the righteousness of God in it. In what? In the gospel. And who is the gospel? Christ. So the righteousness of God in Christ is revealed from faith to faith, according as it has been written, and the righteous one by faith shall live. So when you declare and know the gospel on the righteousness of God in Christ, and you declare that faith to faith, that's how you live your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the gospel is the only way. The gospel is the only truth. So the only way to be saved is through the gospel. The only truth of salvation is the gospel. And the only way to receive life is through the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So what is the gospel of Christ? Let's look at a few terms that the Bible uses. The Bible says that the gospel of the kingdom so what are we, where does this the kingdom of God appear the most? And the kingdom of heaven. Actually, the kingdom of heaven appears the most in the book of Matthew. Like we were talking about Jesus, the king of the Jews. 
So Jesus brought the kingdom. Where Jesus is, the kingdom of God is there. The kingdom of heaven is there. So we have the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel to the poor. And what is the good news to the poor? That you're going to be poor. No, just be humble in your poor state. No, the gospel to the poor is my God shall supply all my needs. He wants you out of that situation because how can you be a blessing to someone if you can't even have enough for yourself? God wants you to be supplied so much that you can be a blessing to other people. Like Abraham, all the stories in the Bible, Abraham, David, all of these guys were filthy, stinky rich. They were so rich. They were, they, they, one time David gave something like $2 billion away. Not away, he gave it to God. But they had so much. Why? So that they could be a blessing to others. The gospel of the grace of God. So it's the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of God. The gospel of His Son. The gospel of Christ. And then Paul says, it's my gospel. So when you have the revelation that all my sins are forgiven and I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, you can say, it's my gospel. It's my good news. Then, the gospel of peace. Why? Because God is no longer angry with you. Amen. When you know that God is no longer angry with you, you have got peace. And it's the gospel of peace. Then, it's Christ's gospel. Then, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Wow. Wow. It's also known as the truth of the gospel. The gospel is the truth. In Galatians, Paul says that how have you departed from the truth? The gospel is the truth. The gospel to Abraham. How did Abraham get saved? Through the gospel, through believing in Jesus. That there will be a lamb of God who will die for his sins. The word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. The mystery of the gospel. What does mystery mean? It was concealed in the Old Testament, but now it's revealed in the New Testament. The hope of the gospel. What is the hope? What is the gospel? That Jesus died for our sins, He, he was buried, He rose again, and that He's coming back again. So we have the hope of the gospel that Jesus is coming back. That's our blessed hope. Hallelujah. Then it's our gospel. So if you guys believe that Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins and you put your trust in Him and you know that you have a righteousness of God in Christ, you can say it's our gospel. Yes. Then the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel according to the power of God, according to Jesus. Then it's known in Revelation as the everlasting gospel. So this is the gospel it's an everlasting gospel. Hallelujah. And who is the gospel? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So let's take a look at where Paul tells us about the gospel. Clearly he says this is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you would also you received and in which you stand. Verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. So this is amazing. Paul received the gospel, not from Peter, not from John, not from another person. He received the gospel from Jesus. The same way that he received the revelation of the communion from Jesus, he received the gospel directly from Jesus. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. And then here is the first of all, the principal thing of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Like we read in Matthew, call his name Jesus, for he was saved his people from their sins. And then, so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. It says in Matthew, that Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. 
And that's why the communion is so important, because each time when you partake of a cup, you are saying, thank you, Lord Jesus, that all my sins are forgiven through your blood. And then 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the first day, according to the Scriptures. And why is it so important that Jesus rose from the dead? Because the Bible says in Romans 4, Christ rose again for our justification, for our being declared righteous. So why did we read in Romans 1 verse 17? For the righteousness of God in Christ, in the gospel, is revealed from faith to faith. So every day you need to know, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. So firstly, the principal thing is, I'm forgiven of all my sins. And then, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. And faith to faith. So what is faith? Like we've said previously. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen. Wow. But let's look at Dr. Sam's definition. Okay. Faith is positively expecting, receiving, trusting, looking to Jesus for all good things in your life and future and having an assurance that it will be it will manifest hallelujah so 1 corinthians 15 verse 3 says first of all christ died for our sins so why is it so important to hammer on this and like peter says i'm not tired of keep having to keep on reminding you Peter says that I don't, it's not a labor for me to, having to keep on reminding you that your sins are forgiven through Jesus. Why is it so important? Why is it so important? The knowledge of Christ. So let's take a look at 1 Peter 1, verse 1 to 11. To know why is it so important to remember and be forgiveness conscious. Because you might know it in your mind, but do you know it in your heart? Do you live it out? Do you live out that you are forgiven of all your sins? Because if you live out you are forgiven of all your sins, there will be qualities to your life. There will be attributes that everyone can see. So let's take a look. And we want to answer some questions. Like how do you obtain like precious faith? How to have grace and peace multiplied to you? What has Jesus given you? How do you receive all things? And why does the divine qualities not operate in some believers? Okay. So let's start in 2 Peter 1, 1 verse 1. So Simon Peter, a bond servant. Bond servant there means he's, he's chosen to serve Christ. It's for, in the Old Testament where you love your master and you want to serve him. So it's not a slave. He's a slave that's chosen to be a slave. And apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So what is this like precious faith? It's a faith that we all have because we know we have the righteousness of God in Christ. Because it says, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of our God. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So when you know you have a righteousness of God in Christ, you've got this precious faith, which is a gift from God. Hallelujah. And then it says, verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So when you receive knowledge from God, grace and peace is multiplied to you. So faith by faith. So the more you learn about Jesus, the more you look to Jesus, the grace and peace is multiplied to you. Every day, when fresh beholding of Jesus, every day fresh revelation of Jesus multiplies grace and peace to you. Like it says in John, it says grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you guys listening? As His divine power, let's go to verse 3. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life 
and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. So what is that saying? As He is divine power, divine there is godly, as He is Dios dunamis, as His miracle working godly power has given to us all things. So does that mean God has only given you some things? Or a few things? No, all things. Like it says in Philippians 4 verse 19, My God shall supply all my needs according to His riches in glory. So that means if God has this much, He's going to give you this much. Everything He's got. Not just a little bit out of what He's got. Everything. So all things. All things that pertain to life. And this life is Zoe life. What does that mean? Physical life here on earth. Because why do you need health in heaven? You're going to be healthy in heaven anyway. You need health now. Why do you need money in heaven? The streets are paved with gold. You need money now. So that you can be a blessing to others. You need things now. So God is saying all things for life now. And godliness. And this godliness is to have reverence to God. That fear of the Lord. That worship of the Lord. Hallelujah. Through, so how do you obtain this all things? Through the knowledge of Him. Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. So what is this knowledge? What is this knowledge? What have I been talking about for all time? That all your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you know you are forgiven of all your sins, His divine power will give you all things to have life and godliness. Why do I say that? Who call this by glory and virtue. What is this glory? If you look at the word and how it's used in the Septuagint, it means to lift up. What did Jesus say? As the, son of, as the serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So it's talking about Jesus' death on the cross. Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel. Then it talks about virtue. His glory and virtue. What is this virtue? So the word there, if you look at, at, at its root, where it's used also actually means the car. Like the male child to remember. But then it talks about where the Lord is worthy. Only He is worthy because there's an excellence towards Him. So who's the one that was worthy to be slain for us? Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. So that virtue is that only Jesus is the sinless Lamb that could be slain. Worthy is the Lamb, not us. So the knowledge of Christ. And then it's through the glory and virtue. And this glory is that Christ was lifted up because He is the only one worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Like in Revelation, who's the one worthy to open the seals? Only Jesus. Hallelujah. So when you know that the Lamb was slain for your sins, and that He was lifted up, He died for your sins, then all the divine power will be supplied for you for all things. Hallelujah. So let's continue. You guys look like you don't believe me. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Let's just stop there. By which have been given to us. By which have been given to us. So through the knowledge that all your sins have been forgiven by Jesus, you can get all the exceedingly great and precious promises. Because what does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 18 to 20? In Christ, every promise is yes and amen. But how do you know you can access that? Because you know Jesus died for your sins. So because Jesus died for your sins, you can say yes, amen. What does yes and amen mean? Yes means I, I'm taking that. I'm receiving that promise. Amen means so be it. So when I'm saying these things and you're just keeping quiet, then you're not getting the promise. You need to say Amen. You need to say yes. When I say you're forgiven of all your sins, then you should say yes. Amen. Because what happens then? When you say yes and amen, 
that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. Verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And the word here, used here for virtue is different to the previous one. The word here means to praise, to worship the Lord. Like we said, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. The word there for perseverance is endurance, patience. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love, agape. What does Peter say? For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Come, sissy. All your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Yes? Amen? Yes, amen? Say amen. Okay, so if you don't have diligence, if you don't have faith, if you don't have knowledge and virtue, self-control, perseverance, patience, let's actually look at those qualities. Please go down. Please go down. Another one. So diligence, faith, moral excellence, virtue, worthiness. So praising Jesus, worshiping Him because worthy is the Lamb. Then knowledge, understanding, self-control. If you eating more than you should, if you're doing stuff where you shouldn't do because you don't have self-control, then tonight you're going to be set free. Then perseverance, patience, endurance, brotherly kindness, friendship. If you're not friendly to people, then love, agape. Why don't people have these qualities? Why does the Bible say people don't have love? Why does the Bible say they don't, they're not friendly to people? Let's take a look at verse 9. So go up again, please. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from all his old sins, from his old sins, his former sins. So when you forget... And you're not forgiveness conscious. Then these attributes, these qualities aren't operating in your life. When you forget that you're not the righteous, when you, when you forget that you're the righteousness of God in Christ and you think you're something else, you're a sinner. Or if you forget that you're forgiven of all your sins and you think, no, I need to plead for forgiveness every time when I do something wrong. Then these attributes will not be operating in your life. You need to have a confidence, an assurance, like we said. Faith is an assurance, a guarantee that all your sins are forgiven and that you have a righteousness of God in Christ so that you can be diligent, have faith, moral excellence, praise the Lord, have self-control, patience, and love for people. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says to him who is forgiven much, the same loves much. So if you don't know you're forgiven, you can't love people. That's why if you feel like, I don't have love for people, then you're not forgiveness conscious. That's what the Bible says. So, why are some people, like we said, it also says that they are blinded. They are bl blinded. Go up please. They are blinded. Verse 9. They are short-sighted, dim-sighted. So what causes blindness? What causes you to not to, to have the truth of all your sins being forgiven hidden from you? What causes that? Okay, we're going to take a look at that. Firstly, let's say that the Bible, when you read the Bible, it's like looking into a mirror. Okay? When you read the Bible, it reflects back to you. Okay? It talks to you. When you. If the Bible doesn't talk to you, then maybe you should just read it a little bit and read it over and over and over so that it does talk to you, okay? Don't read paragraphs. Just read sentences and ask for Holy Spirit to speak to you. But anyway, the Bible is a mirror. And actually, there's two mirrors in the Bible. 
Just from looking at the Bible, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. So there's a mirror in the Old Testament and there's a mirror in the New Testament. Hallelujah. But the New Testament actually only starts in Acts. Eh? The Gospels is also part of the Old Testament. But the New Testament is in the Old Testament. And then the Old Testament has the New Testament concealed, like we said, a mystery. But the New Testament has the Old Testament revealed. If that confuses you, then just forget it. Let's continue. Okay. So, let's take a look at two mirrors in the Bible. Okay. So, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Paul explains to us the two mirrors. So the first mirror is the law. When you are under the law, you are not forgiveness conscious. When you are under the law, you are blinded. And the word here for law is the same word used in the Old Testament for Torah, actually. Because when you don't see Jesus in the Torah, you're anyway blinded. Okay, you're blinded if you don't see Jesus in the Torah. But Jesus revealed in the Torah becomes the gospel. So the first mirror is the law. The second mirror is the gospel or, G or Jesus. Jesus is the gospel, the truth. Okay, so let's read 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Yes, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Verse 6, He who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Verse 9, For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Verse 10, For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Verse 11, Therefore, since we have such hope, we, are, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even, to, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. Verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Wow! So we're reading lots of verses tonight. Okay. So, I, you guys don't have to worry. We're not going to read again. I simplified it for you. Okay. So, show them please the first image of the two, of the two mirrors. Oh, it's small. It's written a bit small, but that's okay. So, 
The first mirror is the law, okay? The second mirror is the gospel, Jesus. If you can't see, you can come closer. So the law, like it says in John 1, verse 17, the law was given through Moses, a servant, okay? But grace and truth came through Jesus, the Son. So it's interesting, God separates. He says the law and then grace and truth. So truth is on the side of the gospel, grace. So is it saying that the law isn't truth? No, the law is true. The law is right. The law is holy. But it's not the truth. The truth is the gospel. It's not the truth. The law is true, but it's not the truth. So then, like we read now in 2 Corinthians, you guys can go over 2 Corinthians 3, but just believe me, I put it on the right side every time. Okay. So the law is written with ink. But what is the gospel? The gospel is written with the Spirit. And the Spirit of the living God. Wow. And then, the law is written on tablets of stone. But the gospel is written on tablets of flesh, the heart. And then, when the, law is, uh, when the gospel is written with the Spirit and on tablets of flesh, what does that mean? We can trust through Christ toward God. We can put our faith in Christ toward God because the Spirit has written on our hearts. Hallelujah. Then, the, the law is the ministry... I'm going to have to go this side. The law is the ministry of the old covenant of death while grace the gospel is the ministry of the new covenant of the spirit then the law is the letter which kills the gospel is the spirit that gives life the law was written and engraved on stones what was written and engraved on stones the ten commandments then the gospel is the ministry of the Spirit written of the Spirit. But then it says, the written and engraved on stones was glorious. It says it, it was glorious. Let me actually go there when you guys can see where I'm reading. Okay, it says here, glorious, glory on Moses' counter. So when Moses came down, uh, when Moses gave the Ten Commandments, it was glorious, okay? And His face shone, but it's a glory that is passing away, it's getting less. While here, it says, more by far much more glorious. So, if the law was glorious, how much more grace? It's far more glorious. And it does not pass away, it's increasing, increasing. Hallelujah. Then the law is the ministry of condemnation. If you do not do that, you'll be cursed. If you do that, you don't do it good enough, you'll be cursed. Here, it's the ministry of righteousness. It's a gift. Hallelujah. Then the ministry of condemnation had glory. But the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Hallelujah. Then if you compare the two, the one is not glorious. The other one is superior glory. The law was glorious but passing away, while grace, the gospel, remains much more. It remains forever. Why don't we read Revelation? It's the everlasting gospel, and it's much more glorious. Moses veiled his face, so you couldn't see the glory passing away. But actually, when you read Exodus, when did Moses, uh, 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 it's in Exodus, when Moses gave the Ten Commandments again because he broke it the first time and he came down the mountain and his face shone. Why was it shining? Because God showed him grace. God said, put the law in under the mercy seat. So it was actually a mixture of law and grace here. That's why his face shone. So he veiled his face and it's passing away. Yeah, we can shout out such hope, great boldness of speech. Hallelujah. And here the minds are blinded, they veiled. But here the veil is removed, taken away because of Jesus Christ. And when you read the Old Testament under the law, you can't understand it. 
And when you read the New the Old Testament under grace, you can understand it. Next one, please. So you can perceive, you can't perceive here, you see? You can't perceive why? Because the veil is on your heart. But here, you can perceive. Because when you repent and turn to the Lord Jesus, the veil is taken away. And then Luke 24 talks about how Jesus said the prophets and the Psalms and all the things Moses wrote talked about me. And then Jesus said, receive the Spirit. And then he said, I open up your understanding so that you can understand the Old Testament. So the Holy Spirit opens up our understanding so that we can understand the Old Testament. Then the Lord is the Spirit. So in 2 Corinthians 3, it says the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes. But who is the Spirit? The Lord is the Spirit. Who is the Lord? Jesus. Yes. So Jesus is the Spirit. And Jesus is the Gospel. Then it says, the Torah is not the Gospel. The Lord is true, but it's not the truth. So the Gospel is in the Torah, but it's concealed, it's closed. It's a mystery. It's only unveiled in the New Testament. Then the law equals bondage, but the Spirit of Jesus equals freedom. Hallelujah. Galatians 5 says that the law is the yoke of bondage. And James 1 verse 21 to 25 says the law of freedom. So like we said, the Holy Spirit bears witness with you. So when you say, I'm a free man, I can do what I want. Actually, you're not free. You don't do what you want. You think of thoughts you shouldn't think of. You do things you shouldn't do. But when you flow with the Spirit, you're a free man. Hallelujah. Then, this was useless glory passing away. But this is the glory of Jesus. And then how do you act under the law? You have to do. It's about doing. Which is not faith. Galatians 3 verse 12 says, The law is not faith. But here, it's about beholding, looking at Jesus, which is faith. Yes. Hallelujah. And what happens when you're under the law? You preserve, you stay the same, and you get worse, and it leads to death. But here, under the gospel, you transformed into the same image as Jesus from beholding to beholding His glory to glory Hallelujah! and how does this happen? by the Spirit of Jesus and it's effortless because the Spirit does it so you trust in Jesus and not in yourself Hallelujah! yeah what's the purpose? because we know the Lord is good yes the Lord is good the Lord is holy there's nothing wrong with the law. But what was the purpose of the law? To bring you to the end of yourself. To say, I need a Savior because I can't fulfill the law. I need a Savior. Because if you read Matthew, what did Jesus say? Like I said, the Gospels is still under the Old Testament. What did Jesus say? If you look at a woman and lust for her, you've already committed adultery. So, Everyone thinks it's outwardly. If you do it outwardly, then it's a sin. No, Jesus says inwardly, you've already sinned. So, some people want to fulfill the Sabbath. And they say, no, we can rest on, on the Sabbath. But if you have stress on your inside, you're not resting. If you have thoughts and you're thinking of stuff other than God, you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. If you're thinking of other stuff, even if you're sitting in church reading the Bible, but while you're reading, you're thinking of other stuff, you're not loving God. So no one can fulfill or do the Ten Commandments. And then you say, no, okay, I'm good with nine of them, but just one of them I sometimes miss up. James says, if you do one thing wrong under the law, you're guilty of them all. Wow. So let me show you guys a picture so show them the picture now, please, of the law. That's the, the, so the law is a mirror, okay? So when you look in the law, so you're a little cat, and you look in the law, the law says you are bad, and you need a savior. You see? See that cute little cat? The cat thinks, I'm okay. I'm okay. So he reads the, he reads the Bible. 
he reads the mirror, he looks at the mirror, the mirror says, you need a savior. Okay? You don't know it, but you need a savior. So see, ah, I need a savior. Yes. Now, show them the gospel, the grace, please. The gospel of grace. So when you look at the new covenant and you say, as Jesus is, so am I in this world. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That's so then you like a little cat looking at her and you see a lion. Because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. And that's what James says. So let's quickly take a look at James, please. Where's my notes? Okay, so James says, James, we'll just go to the end at the bottom. James 1 verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So what people don't understand, they think, okay, I shouldn't just read the Bible, I should do things also, which is wrong, because why did we just read? What's the law? It's about doing. Okay, so that's not what James is talking about. While grace, the gospel, was about beholding, beholding Jesus. So what is he actually saying? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man, observing his face in a mirror. So you're like that little cat looking at the mirror. And you look at Jesus as the lion. So you see, okay, Jesus is like this. And so am I in this world, because I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So I am a righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not a sinner. But then you turn around and you act like a sinner. What is that actually? You're actually a hypocrite. Because you look as Jesus does. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. But now you act like this. So then you're a hypocrite. But then, if you're under the law, you're not saved. And that's that little cat with the ugly face. Okay? And you turn around... And you act like a lion or you act like not a sinner. You're also a hypocrite. Because you are a sinner. You see. So what Paul is, uh, uh, James is saying here is verse 23. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of freedom and continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This one will be blessed in what he does. And why did we read in 2 Peter 1? That what mustn't we forget? What does he say? You mustn't forget. Because you look in the perfect law of liberty. What mustn't you forget? The gospel. Because you're beholding the gospel. And what does the gospel say? I am forgiven of all my sins. I am freely, fully, forever forgiven of my past present and future sins and people always have a problem when you say future sins because it's like how can Jesus forgive me of my future sins okay so were you born before Jesus died no so then all your sins are future anyway okay and then I'm the righteousness of God in Christ so then you be holding looking at the mirror and then you know that's how I look so now I can act like it because what does Peter say Peter says, if you don't know how you look, you're like a dog that goes back to its vomit. You're like a, a pig that rolls in the mud. Why? Because that person thinks he's a dog. That person thinks he's a pig. Because he doesn't know he's a son of God, a child of God. He's forgiven of all his sins. Because when you know you're forgiven of all your sins, you love much. When you know you're forgiven of all your sins, you've got self-control. So every day you can say, thank you, Lord. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus, for I am forgiven and righteous. Hallelujah. And then all things that pertain to life and godliness flow towards you. Hallelujah. That's good. Amen. Remember, you have to say amen to activate the promises of God. Because Abraham said, Amen. God said, I declare you righteous. And when Abraham said, Amen. That's the first place where our man appears. Amen. In the Bible. And what did Abraham also do? He brought the 
a grave with tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek brought the bread and the wine. Hallelujah. And we'll talk about that because 2 Corinthians 3, there's like a lot of pages left, but there's no time left. So we'll continue that another time. So, but we'll talk about the communion again. Hallelujah. And why is it so important to remember the communion? Because when you remember the communion, you're looking at Jesus being lifted up, which is glory. And why does it say, glory to glory we are transformed? So you're looking at Jesus being lifted up, dying for you. Hallelujah. And the other glory is you're looking at Jesus who died for you, but he's seated at the right hand of God. That's the tithe. Hallelujah. So the first glory is the communion. The second glory is the tithe. Hallelujah. So let's partake of the communion. Hallelujah.